Hello, and welcome to this week's Rights in Russia interview. Our guest today is Dmitry Makarov, a leading Russian human rights activist of the Moscow Helsinki Group, where he's also the program coordinator. As you know, the Moscow Helsinki Group is Russia's oldest human rights organization, originally funded by Soviet dissidents in 1976 to monitor the Soviet government's implementation of the 1975 Helsinki Accords. Dmitry also conducts training courses in Russia and the former Soviet Union on human rights advocacy and campaigning. Previously, he was a member of the Coordinating Council of the International Youth Human Rights Movement based in Voronezh. He was also one of the initiators of Legal Team, a group that provides legal support to grassroots activist groups. Thank you for being here today, Dmitry, and sharing your perspectives on the current situation in Russia. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And it seems that all of those titles and previous experiences are no longer relevant. But as a member of the Council of Moscow Helsinki Group, I'm still part of a leading group in this okay. very respect, respected and the eldest functioning mm -hmm. human rights group. Okay, so starting uh, with uh, these series of questions, uh, we've heard that Russia is forbidden to call the Russian invasion of Ukraine a war. Is that really the case? And if so, why? I mean, you can see a certain Orwellian logic behind it, uh, but technically the, what the law says is, is that uh, uh, spreading the fake information about the uh, Russian military is penalized. And since this uh, whole endeavor uh, was called uh, a special military operation, which is, that is what the media should be transmitting. But of course, I mean, if you don't name the war a war, it's still a war. And this is what we see in, in Ukraine at the moment. It is a war, regardless of what the Russian government wants official media to say. So how much propaganda is there in the Russian media right now? Is there any news in Russia about what's really going on in Ukraine? And where do people get their information about the course of the war? Well, I mean, uh, propaganda is a difficult subject because obviously if a person wants to, to learn about from different sources, he or she can. And there are a number of independent media that continue to report, uh, despite the fact that they are uh, either labeled as foreign agents or the websites are blocked altogether. There's been a series of blockages of independent media sources. But you can bypass that and you can read if you want to. The, the tragedy of a situation most of the people don't really want um, to get alternative uh, sources. Uh, and um, the people who read them have been leaving the country en masse also. And that's a problem as well. So you mentioned that uh, some of these media sources were blocked. Uh, is that true uh, with Twitter and Facebook uh, as well? And is it possible uh, to get around that blocking? Twitter and Facebook have been uh, slowed down. Uh, sometimes they're not accessible or accessible at a very slow speed. But once more, I mean, you can you can bypass that if you're technically if you have some basic uh, knowledge of VPN, which seems that pretty much everyone who wants now does. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Um, so moving on to the, the new fake news law, um, why, why did authorities introduce this law with those extreme penalties of apparently up to 15 years in prison? I mean, uh, there's a certain, there's been a certain tendency to 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 weaponize, you know, information, and this is what we've seen for quite some time. And uh, in a devilish way, I mean, if you look at the different pieces of the puzzle, you see that this whole invasion uh, and this whole operation was planned probably months in advance, uh, and uh, the attacks on independent media or closing down of memorial you may see pattern there. You may see pattern of targeting any type of institutions that are there to challenge the regime. And I mean, Navalny's um, poisoning and also his imprisonment and destruction of his entire infrastructure is also part of that puzzle. 
So technically, if you are mobilizing for that type of uh, um, operation, for this type of war, you basically want to get rid of any voices that can say something about it that are influential enough. So the question is, who do you judge influential enough? And that's where kind of uh, the targets are being chosen based on that assumption, I would suppose. Mm -hmm. And the fake news legislation is part of that picture as well. You need some label. How do you name the information that is unfavorable to your goals? Right. Um, so kind of looking at the situation, I mean, what we see here is that there seems to be strong resistance from Ukrainian troops. And at the same time, there are reports of Russian troops bombing civilian areas and Putin has even mentioned nuclear weapons. How is the Russian public reacting to all of this? And what's the, do you have a sense of the current state of Russian public opinion? I mean, there are several efforts at the moment to, to, to get the um, sort of idea of that, of that uh, opinion. I mean, I'm not a sociologist. I can only judge by, by the discussions that I have in various circles. And once more, there are several typical reactions and there are several narratives constructed around this. One narrative, I would say, shared by the liberal democratic elites, I would put it this way, is that this is a complete horror and uh, we are to blame because we didn't stop it, we missed it altogether. It's partly true, it's partly self-blaming and so on. There's another narrative that says, I mean, uh, it is unfortunate that people are dying, but we had to do that because otherwise we'll be attacked by the West. It's sort of a narrative kind of stemming from the Cold War sentiment and not really reflective about the, the cost the human costs of this whole this whole situation and there are also kind of people who are generally lost and they say that there is no truth out there we don't know who to believe it's all fake news and this is what the i mean propaganda has been successful in this it's not only about planting your own information it's also about creating a sense that there is no truth out there so in that sense i mean the more uh, lies you spread, it may even have seem as lies. It also has a disruptive effect because people no longer believe what they see and they construct their own pictures of realities. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing people, I mean, the reality is so horrific that people are constructing their own bubbles once more. And it's not only about Russian propaganda. I mean, Facebook bubbles are pretty much about the same thing. Mm -hmm. The whole social network, I mean, Twitter is also about this. I mean, and it takes a lot of effort to come out of those bubbles. And unfortunately, and I probably jump to another question here. I mean, unfortunately, the, the whole response to this was actually let people sit in those bubbles, close down the channels of communication, close down academic exchanges, close down intellectual discussions, close down in the entire country into that bubble. And I think it's not a very productive response if you want to end the war, not to provoke a future escalation. So you mentioned uh, across the whole country, do you have a sense of, of public opinion outside uh, urban areas like Moscow and St. Petersburg? Well, I mean, is it pretty much the same? I, I don't want to um, overestimate also the amount of disagreement and open opposition, but there are has been hundreds of cities um, engaged. In hundreds of cities, people have been engaged in some sort of anti-war movement. I mean, the number of appeals by different professional groups, the number of signatures after under a common appeal has exceeded uh, in 1 million to 100,000 and so on. So it's unprecedented previously. It's not enough to stop the war. It's not enough to talk about the majority. But that's, a, that's an active position in a very repressive society. Aside from that, you have quite dissent. You know, people in the stores discussing our czar, you know, has gone completely crazy. Who, I mean, or uh, I'm afraid for my children being sent to, 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 to kill Ukrainians. I mean, those discussions are going on outside of Facebook bubble, outside of social media, outside of the capitals. They are taking place. Uh, what, to what, 
it will transform. Will it transform into action? Will it transform into economic protest or discontent? Will it transform into blame, the shifting of a blame, not from Putin towards the West? I mean, it's yet to see. Uh, and of course, we're also limited by the fact that sociological research, sociological analysis, the polls are almost never accurate in a repressive society. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling to, to answer that question mm -hmm. more um, yeah. clearly than that. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking now about uh, uh, President Putin and watching videos of him talking to his ministers in an empty hall or around a long table, you get the impression that he's an isolated leader. I mean, how true is that? And, and kind of second question, why do you think he's invested so much sort of economic and human resources as well as the political future in this destructive military adventure? Well, I'm not a criminologist, and I know that a lot of people have been trying to get into Putin's head lately. I'm not going to even attempt. Uh, I mean, but uh, I think I would warn against judging this whole endeavor as just a crazy gesture. I think it has been a calculated move. It may have been miscalculated, because if you surround yourself by loyal people, they tend not to tell you the truth. So I think there have been enormous miscalculations in that decision. But the question is how does the system uh, recover from that? How does it take back? And usually doesn't. So in that sense, they are trying to, to fit the reality uh, to justify their mistakes. They're trying to, to sell the myth of a successful invasion. They're trying to sell the myth that they achieve in the goals of what they said, although the goals keep on changing. I mean, if you look at the public rhetoric. So it's part of a problem when you run a dictatorship. It's also a part of a problem of circling all the decisions on Putin. And I would also warn about us making that mistake. I think much more interesting would be what, how can society, how does society respond to that? Because the most interesting discussions are not in those, around those long tables by men in military uniforms, but actually in the families and young people confront the older generation all of this. Or in places of authority, like in the universities, when the student groups confront the leadership, or people are sending letters to the deputies. You may think that, I mean, what does a deputy decide in a system which is run by basically a, a small number of men, you know? But this is what how democracy should look like. You're asking your representative so people, in a way, are trying to exercise in a non-democratic system the right to question the authority. And that's a much more important process. And I know where it will lead, because we don't see in the Security Council, we haven't seen a single brave man to question. But right now, there are many thousands of brave men and women that are questioning authority on different levels, even if it's authority in the family authority at the university or at your, your employment place. And this is a much more interesting process. And I think that's how societies grow and mature. It's just very sad and tragic that it took such a horrendous events for that process to really start. And, and are, there, uh, are there continuing, I mean, is, do the uh, non-governmental organizations that have been built up over the past uh, 25, 30 years, are, are any of them still functioning? Is that part of civil society still uh, working effectively? Or do you see this as, as more of a, uh, a grassroots bottom up? Uh, kind of movement of individuals, students, et cetera? I would say the latter, actually. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also quite sad and quite symptomatic that organized civil society groups have been left out of this primary. I mean, uh, it's, it's probably a subject of a different discussion, but at the moment it's feminist groups, it's women rights groups, it's student initiatives, it's really grassroots, and uh, it's not that much connected with the traditional human rights NGOs or civil society groups and so on. 
uh, we are working on building those links, although it's not always necessary because some of those groups are much more advanced in the organizing that is needed in those conditions. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, human rights movement, which may uh, be more advantageous in, as experts or as litigators mm -hmm. or as people who write reports, I mean, all of this is not relevant. You need community organizers. You need people who draw campaigns. You need movement builders. You don't really need people who can issue a statement. That's a sad reality. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's good to know. That's good. Thank you. Um, looking at this situation generally, in your view, what should the West be doing now in, in response? Well, I also struggle with the whole concept of the West. We see united response, but in many ways, it's an emotional response. You know, the, the companies that are drawn out of the governments that are stopping all sorts of relations are kind of want to, to fence off and to say, I mean, we, we don't want to be part of this. We don't want to, 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 to be seen in any way as supportive of this. And I sympathize with this. I, I'm in solidarity with that, but I also kind of mm, concerned that beyond that emotional response, there is no real strategy. Um, and so in that sense, the, the, there needs to be strategy and not just the government strategy that seems to be supply the arms, you know, resist, support Ukraine and so on. Fine. I mean, you do what you, 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 you can do, but beyond that, I mean, how, what kind of world do you want to build out of this mess? I mean, and that's a question that almost no one is asking at the moment. So I think one of the response, at least of civil society groups should be not only about, uh, you know, tending the wounds of the victims, supporting the refugees that are coming millions, but also thinking about how do we um, kind of um, propose a different solution? Mm -hmm. How we, do we not only let the leaders from all sides that led us to this, uh, take decisions once more over our future? Because I mean, it's very true in Russia, but in many ways it's also true in the so-called West. I mean, the civil society should have a sit at the table during those discussions. And at the moment, that's not the case. So following on to that, you recently wrote with Mary Caldor an appeal for a new pan-European security system based on human security rather than national security with the rule of law and human rights and justice at its core. So what has been the response to that appeal? I mean, we are having discussions um, around this with a number of people, and uh, many are now realizing in academia or in policy circles that this, this discussion is as urgent as it, ever, as it ever was, you know? And also that those connections between human rights, rule of law, something that has been apparent, you know, to the Helsinki movement since its start, it's still relevant. I mean, and it's kind of like uh, a moment of revelation for many, uh, but I, I, it's not that I dwell in this. I want this to be the momentum when we change as, a, as, a, as societies. So I think in that sense, we, we would have to, 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 to come back to this. Once the hostility settle, once the, the, the pain is at least somewhat healed, mm -hmm. I don't know, how much it will take, but those who can stay right now with an open heart to all the horrors that are taking place, but also with a cold mind, I would encourage them to ask that question. How do we let, how did we allow this to happen? And what should we do for that not to happen again? And kind of that's a question that the civil society movements have been asking, you know, since last century, right? <laughs> right? Right, well, I, absolutely. Um, turning to other plans, uh, what do we know about the Russian authorities' plans for kind of the near term and then the longer term? Do, do you think uh, these plans will be realized and to what extent and 
What do you think will be the eventual outcome? I mean, they certainly don't discuss it with us, right? Uh, and they've been telling lies about that, that for, for to the so-called Western partners for, for such a long time. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's hard to predict. I also think that they were caught by surprise by the, this reaction. Uh, they, there's going to be a lot of economic hardship also. So, I mean, it's a very uncertain time. So if there were plans, I think they are all being changed at the moment. But uh, I mean, and we'll see what comes out of it. I probably wouldn't be able to say more. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of for a final question, I, I, I'm, I'm curious about your views of kind of Western philanthropy in building up civil societies in, in repressive countries. I mean, what, what is your sense of the long-term effectiveness of that? And, and what, would you, what would you recommend for the future? Well, I mean, if we have the future, <laughs> then uh, that, that's a point of discussion. And I think uh, it's very sad that such discussions have been taking place in the larger philanthropy circles, but have not touched really the human rights sphere. I mean, there are a number of discussions how should philanthropy or development aid should look like. There is enormous criticism of how it was structured before, but somehow it doesn't really involve the human rights groups. On the other hand, our region as a whole is also has been left out of those discussions. And I've been trying to, I mean, I've been involved in a number of those processes. I've been trying to say that our region is too important to be left out. And we don't really fit, you know, into the traditional you know, north-south paradigm, traditional colonial, decolonial view. And we need to reflect about this. We need to find the, the ways to describe it and we need a, a kind of practical solutions out of it. And unfortunately, that was not really heard. So I feel that in a way, the, the importance of that region, the post-Soviet region, we don't even have a better name for it, you know? what I mean, it's no longer post-Soviet, It's but we, have no conceptual ideas. So it's a military emergency, but it's also a conceptual emergency. We need urgently to come up with those. And maybe then your questions about how can um, philanthropy, which is one way to address the social problems, how can it be transformed, would be easily more easily answered. Uh, uh, I think probably now is not the time, but that's a, it's, it's, a, it's a question that is up in the air. Uh, unfortunately, we were not quick enough to adapt, to adapt towards more people-oriented fundraising, to adapt towards alternative funding models, to adapt towards more community organizing. Maybe this crisis will push us inevitably towards that. Uh, but what we need is we need not only partners that produce projects together with us or that support our projects, we need partners that envision the common movement and that are truly on the same page as us thinking about what future holds. So, and I would like the philanthropic engagement to be about that, not just, you know, support, uh, but also about the common values and common actions. Well, I wish we had more time, uh, but I know you have to catch, catch a train. So um, I want to thank you, uh, Dmitry Makarov, for, for spending this time with us to shed light on the current situation for human rights defenders and for human rights more generally well, in this and, really bleak period. Well, I mean, I am grateful for, for you giving the space, and I'm also grateful to, to you and to Rights in Russia for being kind of a voice of uh, Russian civil society, Russian human rights movement in English. I think it's very important. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is a wake up call and it's also in many ways a window of opportunity. I don't want to undervalue uh, the, the, the costs of it because they are enormous, but we would have to, to transform um, pretty much everything out of this, if we survive. You'll survive. We will survive, right? I believe in that, yes. <laughs> so thank you.
Yes, well, thank you. And, and we wish you the very best and hope to see you again soon on Rights in Russia. We will keep up the conversation. All right, thanks a lot. Yes.